Was it got? Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat for the next session. Was it loud enough? Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat for the next session. Russia will declare the war. And he said, no way, no way. Yeah. The fourth chair. The fourth chair. <laughs> no. And uh, uh, Germany has. Uh,
Yeah. Yeah. Now. If not now, then we could forget everything. And I didn't want to ask the Prime Minister of Ukraine how long she take. She think that this war will last. How much Ukrainian they are? They have 36 million. 80 million or 20 million are already in Europe. They have uh, <coughs> in Ukraine. How much people? Now it's on. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Please come in. We're about to start the next panel, the Liberal Green Deal and tackling climate change and food security. I hope the microphone is not, maybe the volume is too much or is it okay? I speak loud normally. All right, welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, participating and attending this, uh, this panel discussion. Like I said, the topic of uh, this panel will be the Liberal Green Deal. Uh, my name is Jan Huytema. I'm, the mem I'm a member of European Parliament in both the Fisheries Committee, Agriculture Committee, and also in the Environment Committee. I'm MEP from 2014. And next to that, I also do have a dairy farm back home in the Netherlands, in the northern part of the Netherlands, in Friesland. I have approximately 150 dairy cows. And um, we as farmers are really like witnessing climate change at the moment. In 2018, it was one of the most dry season there was. 2019 as well, 2020, and 2021 was super, super wet. And we had very much difficulties to grow grass and feed for our cows. So that shows, uh, as no other, the link, I would say, between climate change, food security, but also biodiversity. What are we going to do today is that we have a keynote speech and also a debate with four panelists. Hopefully, <laughs> the fourth one is uh, still coming. And what I really want to do is have it interactive. So I really need your brain power, your input, and your questions for, for this debate. Hope we can agree on this. Um, in front of you, we have uh, four panelists. The first panelist, I'm very honored to have her here, is Hakima El Ait, who is the president of Liberal International. Next to her, it's Kira Rudik. She's the MP from Ukraine also the party leader of HOLOS, and of course, Alde, vice president. Then we have Jack Chambers, who is the uh, minister, Irish minister of transport, uh, environment, climate, and communications, right? And uh, last but not least, we also have the Finnish minister of agriculture and forestry, Antti Kurfinen. <laughs> and before going to the panel, we also, I'm very honored, to introduce to you uh, Romina Purkatari. She is the Swedish Minister for Climate and Environment. And in about 10, 15 minutes, she will give a keynote speech. And I would like to introduce her already and invite her to, to the stage to give her a speech. A warm welcome to Romina, please. We... Uh we call it the climate crisis, and it is a crisis, but that word cannot paralyze us. Instead, it must lead us to urgently act, and act now. When my party leader asked me to become Sweden's Minister for Climate and the Environment, my first thought was that he's absolutely crazy, and that my time is yet to come. But when thinking about it, I thought of the time frame for climate. And one thing that has always bothered me immensely is that when people talk about the climate, they talk about the future. They talk about it as if it is something happening somewhere else in another time. Everything in politics is about the future. And this, of course, is detrimental to our future if we do not urgently take action. But this symbolic picture painted of climate crisis being something in the future is false. Climate crisis is now. The flooding in Italy is now. El Nino coming for the Amazonas is now. And this dry heat in Stockholm is now. And with that thought in mind, 
I uh, know that I could have taken a step back for many reasons and told my party colleagues to put their trust in someone else. But I also knew that with gathering the second to most votes for my party in the election, I had the responsibility. I had the responsibility to step up and do the work now, not in the future. Now, there are more things that bother me about the climate transition, and I'd like to mention another one. People also tend to discuss climate transition as us lowering our emissions until they've magically disappeared, as if suffocating our economies is the way to enter the future. And this could not be more false. And Sweden is the proof of that. We have decoupled our emissions from our economic growth showing that you can reduce your emissions whilst growing your economy. Now, we of course do not do that every year, but we have had years where that has happened. Climate change, biodiversity loss and depletion of natural resources are big challenges that we're all facing. But we also see an ever-growing awareness amongst citizens, governments and businesses of the need for urgent actions. And now that last part, is vital for the action that we need to take. We should recognize the contribution from the progressive business community as the new environmental movement, contributing in practical terms to the green transition. Only then can we show that the conservative industries refusing to find new methods for producing their products or providing their services, that they will lose. Now, here's where I get to something I actually like. And that's the Green Deal. And not only because of its substance, but also because of the name, Green Deal. Because it is a Green Deal. It's not green charity. It's beneficial to all parties. And that's the secret ingredient to the Swedish climate action. That's where the secret ingredient comes in. Our emitters, the industries and the players that make up our society and contribute to our emissions, they have realized that the economy that we're headed towards is clean, and that if you're not keeping the pace, you're going to lose money. Money is a driving factor of most things in our world, and climate action is no different. So when they saw that national policy with laws, regulation and incentives were moving in a clean direction, they made the choice to be clean and to be sustainable, to be profitable. And this was around some 30 years ago when Sweden adopted carbon taxation and really started to step up policy-wise, which of course has uh, increased uh, later on as well. But we firmly believe that those early movers have a competitive edge in periods of industrial and technological transition. European companies that provide green solutions, they will be in a high global demand and they can help drive the global transition towards a more circular economy. Moving towards a resource-efficient, nature-positive and fossil-free future will require major investments in innovative industries that can translate the best ideas into functional solutions. And us as policymakers must provide the right regulatory framework and the right policies to attract all of those big investments. Now, something that several businesses point out is that it must be financially feasible to be green and sustainable. For example, price mechanisms are needed that make recyclable materials less expensive than virgin materials. Pricing in the EU should reflect all costs to the environment over the entire life cycle, including the recycling step. The EU Green Deal has outlined clear goals to be achieved. However, they must be followed by equally ambitious policy instruments. The challenge is to convert the regulatory framework into market mechanisms that will also steer all economic sectors towards a truly fossil-free, nature-positive and circular economy. And that work ahead is, of course, a big challenge. But it is not a challenge that will be resolved by demonstrating on the streets. That challenge is solved by policymakers truly putting in the work and having the courage that is needed to succeed. Now, to get a bit more personal, I was honestly quite scared when I was appointed minister because all of the sudden, people that I respected and whom I thought would show mutual respect and understanding for different politicians having different opinions and making different decisions, they were all gone. 
I stood in a flood of critical articles in all types of newspapers from Hong Kong to Paris misquoting me and printing untrue facts. I saw floods of hate from racists as well as socialists towards me, going from being young, striving, and a successful elected politician to now all of a sudden being corrupt, bought, and definitely incapable of any type of challenge that I have ahead of me. I even saw members of our own movement criticizing us. And it is definitely okay if you don't agree with our choices. They have taken years for me myself to marinate and work within. But show that respect and decency towards each other. Because if you cannot do that towards each other and have that wonderful, respectful, liberal, open and loud discussions, then we will be our best own enemies. And we liberals have it quite tough enough as it is, fighting racists from the right and socialists from the left. Now, when I got scared, I thought of hiding and backing down, just going doing the normal things that friends my age do. But then I actually thought of my heritage. My parents fled to Sweden from Iran, a country where women way younger than me are being whiplashed and killed for expressing their opinions and for dressing as they want. They are not backing down. They are fighting for their freedom. And here I have the opportunity to not only fight for the freedom and democracy that I have been privileged to be brought up within, but to also fight for the development of my country and for the environment. So I cannot be paralyzed by fear. And my generation should not be paralyzed by a lack of hope. We need to show up and do the work that others will not do. And us liberals have the duty to show up and do that work. And we do it every day, one by one, and we do it here, this weekend, right now, together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Romina. Thank you very much for this inspi inspiring uh, keynote speech. I have to change the program a little bit because mm -hmm. I have also, time is a little bit our enemy here, and I know that uh, Auntie has to leave uh, soon. Um, so. Would it be okay if you would stay here? Because I really want to give the audience a chance to give you uh, ask some questions. And maybe then I can invite you also on the podium. Would it Absolutely. be okay? Absolutely. No Great. Worries. Thank you so much. Okay. Auntie, now I come to you. Um, I would like to ask you first to give a short introduction and maybe a two-minute, three-minute uh, speech. And then I go directly again to the audience to uh, ask if there are any questions or comments. So keep that in mind. I don't know if there is a microphone here that people can go to. It's there on the left. So if you uh, also in uh, saving some time already during the speech, um, stand there to ask the questions, then it will be all smooth. Anti, please, can you introduce yourself? Thank you, and I really have to apologize that uh, in the program, this was 2 p.m. and now it's 3 p.m. and I'm going back to beautiful Finland, which is full of great nature and full of renewable resources. But <laughs> unfortunately, the Swedes are not keeping the plane on the ground, <laughs> even though I would be discussing with you. So maybe I use a um, few minutes time to give some remarks uh, how I, as a standing Finland's Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, see the uh, Green Deal uh, climate, climate crisis, uh, fighting against climate crisis, fighting against mm. laws of nature, and and uh, and ho ho how we as a centrist and liberal should should maybe maybe act in these issues. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to put in your minds, and I hope that you in your eyes see a triangle, because I want to talk about two triangles. Uh, first triangle is that. Always, when we are doing decisions about environment, is it climate, is it nature restoration, all these issues, uh, you have to see that, like the UN uh, has said many decades, if you want to have a sustainable development, you have to have ecology, uh, social justice, and economy, all these three working. We cannot have a booming economy if we are not keeping keep in mind that we are not taking care of our nature and climate, but also when we are doing decisions, for example, about nature restoration, uh, decisions about climate policy, green transition, we have to keep the economy going on just like our uh, address speaker, our tremendous address speaker uh, said. 
and we have to keep in mind the social sustainability for example people living in the countryside how how they are they are in the same train with with for example ur urban people and another triangle i want to put in your mind is is that that um, when we have this horrible aggression in the europe russia's aggression uh, we have to see that it is not reason to stop the green transition, I think so. Because uh, when we do wise policy, like Sweden ha has done, uh, I say we have done better, like we do better in, in, in Eurovision and we do better in ice hockey. We had, uh, <laughs> we had done the green transition even better, better here uh, in, in Finland than here in Sweden. Uh, we, we can, at the same time, we can we can make the our planet we can save our planet we can do the green transition uh, for for the environment and for the nature but at the same time we can boost our economy and we can make europe more secure because if we are dependent on uh, on oil um, coal coming from other parts of the globe maybe coming from from countries that are ruled uh, via despotism, via authoritarian rule, uh, then we are dependent on those countries. And that's why I think uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia's attack is no reason to stop, um, stop innovating in renewable energy. That is not a reason to stop um, nature restoration in, in a wise, wise ways. Uh, few, just a few uh, remarks about agriculture. I think this um, this crisis, both COVID and war in Ukraine, uh, they have they have shown that we need a very resilient, very resilient uh, food chain, and that is not the case in unfortunately in all in in all, in all countries and with all the all the production. Uh, I have to say that war in Ukraine has affected every EU member state. There are various problems. And in one country, there can be uh, other production is in problems. Maybe in Portugal or in, in, in Central Europe, there are other production productions in problems. And Finland, the, the other ones. But all um, all farmers and all, all the um, food enterprises are suffering some, somehow in in our continent. And that's why I think we need 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 to work together. Uh, and we need need um, common solutions. I'm I'm strongly against unilateral embargoes, unilateral restrictions to to uh, import import Ukrainian grain grain to to EU, sta EU states. It's not the right way that member states act act alone and be a little bit opportunistic. Maybe that is that is not the right way. We need, need uh, common common solutions. Uh, and I see that we also have to together help also Ukrainian farmers and, and Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian countryside. The, that is also a thing where we need unity. And, and I think the supporting Ukraine, it's it's a, it's a big thing. It's not only sending weapons. We have to do that also. And we did this week in Finland a new decision also to give give more weapon weaponry. But also we need need. Um, Need need more. Uh, we we need uh, we need help in other sectors, uh, other sectors also. And in the end, before I'm unfortunately leaving leaving this uh, nice panel and I'm leaving this this magnificent uh, congress, uh, I I want to uh, continue a little bit the address speech that uh, I think we cannot left the fight against climate change and fight against nature loss to the green and leftist groups. Uh, because their uh, point of view is to 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 restrict things and stop things, stop living, stop industries, mm -hmm. uh, stop companies, um, and and th that is not the right way. And in the end, I want to say that uh, that uh, we shouldn't be uh, climate monks and climate nuns. This is no monastery that we stop living for climate change. We have to innovate to keep on living. And I, I think that the liberals don't want to go to climate monasteries, not, not maybe a proper place for, for this group. And I think we need, need more, more uh, market mechanism. We need more enterprises, more innovations, more investments. And that is the way to tackle 
tackle the environmental problems. I, I like to warmly thank behalf of the whole Finnish delegation of this weekend and, and keep on doing your great job in your, your countries and we will be stronger in the future, I'm sure about that. Thank you, Antti, and um, yeah, it's a shame that you have to leave, but you the calls. Thanks so much. Um, <coughs> Romina, yes, please, if you can have a seat. Then I would like to continue. Well, Jack, maybe you, if you maybe uh, can give a short uh, introduction and maybe some introduction remarks on this topic. Jack. Thanks, thanks very much, and uh, absolutely delighted to be here. And I want to pick up from uh, what Romina said there about the EU Green Deal. And I think that speaks to the new social contract that we want to establish within Europe, a new contract for citizens um, rooted in people. And part of that is, first of all, the absolute solidarity we have from an Irish perspective to all our friends from Ukraine against the shocking aggression. And when you look at it from a climate uh, perspective, the, uh, the massive biodiversity loss, the huge risk and displacement for, for people, but also the, the overall impact on, on, on climate change within Ukraine, but on the continent of Europe. Europe is on fire. We're seeing that through extreme weather events we're seeing that through um, across a whole range of, of policy areas and what we're keen to do from an Irish perspective is to try and seize that positive opportunity to build a new economy uh, around uh, around taking the appropriate action on climate change so we've a new EU we've a new climate act which is bridged with the EU green deal to look at the new energy transformation the opportunities that will arise from that so we're try trying to get up to seven gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. That's 600,000 homes fueled with renewable energy by uh, with each gigawatt of, of, of energy produced, but also addressing biodiversity loss, um, addressing the enormous crisis we're seeing as well on global, global food security. So when you look at the current figures, we have 800 million people plus that are currently undernourished within our globe. And obviously from a European perspective, there's a lot of self-sustainability, but the weaponization of food by Russia uh, through the invasion of Ukraine has produced enormous displacement across um, the mi Middle East, but also within the African continent. And obviously addressing that conflict from a European perspective is key. And I think we need to commend our colleagues in the European Union on establishing the EU food corridors, for example, in the Black Sea, but also through our Eastern European colleagues. Um, but in the overall um, action on, on climate, it's trying to root everything we do in a just transition. And part of the problem we discussed with um, some leaders earlier on was people, in, particularly in, in, in more rural areas or people that have to are, are being faced with the, the challenges and the impacts of climate change from a policy perspective. You mentioned agriculture and the challenges that farmers are seeing. It's trying to bring people on that journey and seeing them, the, the positive economic opportunities that will arise from taking the, the, the full action uh, on climate change. And from an Irish perspective, um, we've a set of a new, new legislation which ripples through every area of, of policy in, uh, in energy, in agriculture, in transport, where 50% reduction in, in, uh, in emissions by 2030, and trying to take that choice for sustainability in every, in every aspect of life, but also giving the opportunities around digitalization, uh, innovation that will arise from the new uh, EU Green Deal. But we need to try and sell that better as uh, liberals and as European citizens, um, because our, our continent um, is on fire socially, economically, cost of living crisis, and people feel we're imposing a different way of life on them uh, and we need to make sure we bring people with us on that journey and that's what will give us a more sustainable future and a much better future for the political centre uh, to show that uh, and demonstrate that leadership and I think that's the challenge for the 2024 elections is how we can develop the messaging and policies that bring people on that journey that's rooted in a just transition uh, and that takes the positive actions on climate in partnership with people. Thank you Jack. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, please. Kira, um, well, the Ukraine war has men is mentioned by all the, the speakers before uh, already. I have a very good friend, Keishan Huizinga. I don't know if you know him. He's a Dutch farmer in the Ukraine. He's very much on national television in the Netherlands. I had the possibility to, to study with him at Wageningen University, and he is describing to me sometimes the situation, how it is for, as a farmer now in Ukraine. It's without imaginable how that is that you have to be worried about mines when tractoring, uh, diesel shortages, things like this. Uh, and now we're talking about climate change. Is that still on 
yeah, the, your agenda in a way is not the focus on war and indeed producing food. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure and privilege to be speaking to you today. I was at the ALDE party leaders meeting today and I was uh, very pleased to hear that the climate change is like one of the top priorities for most of our sister parties. And so there is one particular thing that I want you to take home with you about what is going on. There is one particular, most effective, immediate thing that can be done for the climate change. And this thing is to help Ukraine win the war. Thank you. There is nothing else that would take such an immediate effect. Last year, the amount of the toxic waste thrown into the air have increased 23 times. Can you even imagine that 23 times from 2 million tons to 46? And you know the pollution? It does not care about the borders, does not care about which passport you are holding, and honestly, if you are an EU member or not, if you're just a candidate. So when we are talking about the climate, every single day there are changes that are irreversible and they are happening. And we all need to work very hard not to help Ukraine win someday, to help us win tomorrow before it is not all gone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm not done. Oh, sorry. This. sorry. This is like... This is just such an emotional issue for me because in Ukrainian parliament, I'm also working as a co-chair of a humane country organization. You know, there is food security issue. Before the full-scale invasion, we were top world's five producers of grain, wheat, sunflower oil, potatoes, and corn. Like, which one of those you don't like? Tell me. Mm -hmm. But now we are robbed of that because 30% of our territory are landmines. It's a territory similar to Portugal plus Greece or half of France. Mm. And it will take decades to clean this out. When we are talking about biodiversity and animals, there is some things that I cannot hold my tears because if you think that what is happening on the occupied territories is just the borders moving in and out, it is not. What we have witnessed that a biodiversity have been significantly destroyed. We have things like, like animals in the zoos being eaten just to prove that they can do that or a situation when we have encountered uh, animals that were hanged on the trees. And I, honestly, in my mind, I cannot find a reason why one would do that. But it is happening right now, and over 35% of biodiversity, of European biodiversity, is endangered. It means that we will leave this world for our children in a much worse condition then, then we have got it. And this is not the one how we want to operate, right? So every single moment when we are thinking of what is happening while we are talking, terrifying crimes, they are not happening against Ukrainian people. They are happening against all of us and our ability to raise the next generation in a really better world. And I'm so thankful because I know that you are all behind me and behind all of us in this matter. Absolutely. But I want you to remember that the time is of an essence if we want to have something left there. And it's terrifying to say because the war is the worst thing that could happen to a country. And it is happening to my country right now. Thank you so much and glory to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Hakima, um, as the president of Liberal International, I, I, I don't know what you wanted to, uh, uh, to, to say today, but what I'm very curious about is not only to have the European perspective, the EU perspective, especially when it comes to food security, but uh, mainly the aspect of food security for third countries. Because, for example, also the grain exports from Ukraine, they go to the European Union, but a lot of other third countries are so much dependent on this. And what will happen there? And how is the situation there? We have maybe inflation in food prices, but they are really lacking the accessibility to food. That's, that's uh, You cannot imagine. Please. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. First, let me b begin by the beginning. Thank Aldi for this extraordinary gathering and wish them a successful Congress. It's very difficult to talk after these ladies and gentlemen, especially a very young Minister of Environment of Sweden and Kira. Who each time we are talking, Kira, I have the feeling I'm very touched by what you are saying. It's very difficult to talk about the war in general. And the war is happening right now in Ukraine, killing civilians, children, women, and impacting, exacerbating climate change. But let me tell you something. The war of climate change is happening for a long time in many sides of this world. I'm coming from Africa. And in Africa, the African people are paying the bill of the impact of climate change on a daily basis. But let me link what is happening in Africa with Ukraine. In the African countries are importing the wheat from Ukraine from 30 to 70 percent of their food security is linked to the production of Ukraine. And this war, which is happening in Europe, and I heard someone say this morning that for some Europeans it's not their war. I will say, this is our war, all of us, even in Africa, because this war, the consequences of this war, are transcending the borders of Ukraine, causing energy insecurity in Europe, inflation worldwide, food insecurity in Africa, and then disturbing the multilateral agenda. The biggest war humanity is facing is not Yugoslavia, Syria, Ukraine. No, it's climate change. This is the biggest war and challenges we are facing. And let me tell you, Minister Romina told it, that it's happening now in Europe. It's we, you, the, the West is already paying the bill of climate disaster. But if the, the West has the financial capacity to pay this bill, the, the global South don't have. And let me also tell you that the, since the Paris Agreement, the CO2 emissions are co in a constant increase. We are hearing about the Green Deal, and I have hope because I was in Paris during the negotiation of the Paris Agreement. And tell, let me tell you that Europe has played a major role in making this agreement happen. Leaded by Laurent Fabius, Europe was a major negotiator to make the Paris Agreement happen. But what has happened since 2015? Nothing. We are hearing promises, we are hearing uh, uh, big deals, and I, I, I'm, 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 very, I'm very sorry, uh, liberals should be optimistic. But today, I will be like Greta Thunberg. Greta used to say, I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I'm feeling every day. Then I want you to act, and today, we need to act. And I want to thank Minister Romina, to thank Sweden, because you have given a very nice example to the world. And I, I have hope when I'm traveling to the Scandinavian countries, because you are giving the example. You are giving the example, the strategy is clear, the policy is clear, but Sweden has made something else which is very important for the world. Greta Thunberg, even if 
I'm not always, I don't always agree with, with what she said, but she transformed the climate agenda to a citizenship agenda. And this is a huge achievement because in the strike, in the street, you can make pressure on the policymakers to change policies and to change the world. So what we need today, we need to act because if we don't end the war, and this is the, the, the word of Kiran, thank you for this word. If we don't end, we have a competition of crises, pandemic, then a war, then I don't know, another pandemic maybe, because our biodiversity is at the risk to, dis to disappear and to collapse. So maybe another pandemic. So there is a competition of, of uh, crises. And the real crisis, we're not doing anything. What are we doing? Let me tell you that in Africa, we have 400 million hectares of arable land who can be used by Europe to feed the world, not only to feed Africa. We have the biggest reservoir of solar energy, which can be used by Europe to to, for, for renewable energy to, to, to electrify Europe. So you, as I, I am lobbying and advocating and standing for a strong Europe, because my dream for the global south is to see a global, a democrat global south, a free the global south, a global south respecting rule of law, equality. But if Europe is not strong, it cannot take its place. If Europe is taking the wrong decisions, impacting the global south, we are pushing the Africans and the others in the hand of authoritarian regimes. And this is what is happening in my continent. Africa Thank you, is thank you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think your point I, is I'm very clear. I'm ending, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, thank you, Akima. And I think also, uh, I like, describe- I have a psychological time. It's <laughs> eight minutes. Yeah, uh, good. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> no, I think it's very good. And there's a very famous study of Wageningen University where they have the map of the world. And there you see the impact of climate change on agriculture. And there you see, especially on the equator, that the food production will go down, be down because of climate change by 50%. Yeah. And these are the regions where you have also the, mo the highest growth rate and uh, population growth in, in the world. So. It's a perfect storm in a way that we really have to do something on this. Sorry, I couldn't, I'm a politician as well, so uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and are there any questions from the audience? I see here one. Uh, maybe you have, maybe Romini, you want to like to react to here as well, I don't know. Oh yes, if it's possible while we're waiting for the microphone. Yes, so I'm, I'm just collecting the questions. Yeah. I have here one. I, I would be great, I have two, maybe one more to have three questions. If not. Maybe uh, can I ask you to move uh, to go to, to the to the microphone and Romina? Yeah, maybe to save to time, I'll just yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to touch up on the subject that Europe has the money to handle uh, consequences of climate crisis and global warming, while the global South doesn't, and that is so true. Uh, and uh, specifically, if you look at Africa and how much they're contributing to uh, the emissions, it's not near as me as much as other parts of the world is contributing. And for that reason, I think it's important. You know, I I glad sit and brag about the Swedish clean energy system and how we have wind and, and solar and uh, uh, hydropower and how everything's, uh, you know, all of the exciting things. But you also have to put your money where your mouth is. And because of that reason, I'm, I'm very uh, eager to increase the work that we do in other parts of the world. It, the emissions don't stay at the country borders and it doesn't, it's not like reaching the moon, you know, getting there first and putting your flag in and going, yes, we won. That's not what it's about. It's about handling quite a holistic crisis and doing it together by helping each other, finding the best solutions and by handling the different uh, the difficulties that we're facing together. So whenever I have a bilateral m uh, meeting, whichever country it is with, we can always learn something from each other. We can learn from each other's mistakes. And if we get to that part where we can have like a more open dialogue and truly exchange ideas, we move forward so much quicker. So it's very important to not be, uh, you know, protectionist to, on the opposite side, be uh, liberal and be uh, solidar uh, solidaric with with uh, both your money and your policy. 
great to get together. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you're holding the presidency now in, in the Council of Sweden to bring all the countries and the, also the European Parliament together. Please, introduce yourself and then ask uh, the question and maybe also um, say to who you direct your question to, please. Yes, hi everyone, my name is Giulio Del Balzo. I am from the National Board of More Europe and Italian Political Party. Thank you so much for this insightful discussion. I would like to ask you, what is your approach to balance uh, uh, economic and environmental priorities, given that it's not always possible to find a good trade-off? I would like to address this question to the ministers, also because I would like to understand if your approach are, are similar or not. And also I would like to ask you, what are your priorities on adaptation? Because we must be pragmatic, we cannot address the entire climate change that is gonna happen. So adaptation policies must be on the agenda. I would like to know what you are working on more specifically. For example, in Italy, I know very well what happened with the flooding. Unfortunately, hydrogeological problems are discussed only after disasters and not before, especially in my country. So the adaptation agenda must be a priority. I would like to know your views. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before uh, going to the answers, um, there was one. Yeah, please, if you can ask your question as well, then we combine it. Uh, thank you. Aoife McCoy, Fianna Fáil, Ireland. Um, I'm just going to address the panel and anybody's uh, free to respond to the question. But the question I have, um, in Ireland we have 137,000 small family farms. So it's a very um, important sector for us in rural Ireland. And the question I have is that where do small family farms fit within the Green New Deal? Is there a place for them with a drive towards scaling up to improve efficiencies? Where do family farms fit in that? Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have one question. Maybe I need to start with the ministers. So maybe Jack, maybe you can, uh, can come in on the possible trade-offs and how to react or act to that to be between economics, ecology, and maybe social aspects, and indeed on climate ad adaptation. So maybe you can... Uh, yeah, so <coughs> what we try to do <coughs> across all our investment streams in um, in government, as I said, we have a new climate act which underpins the um, sectoral emissions targets across all areas. I think if you take the private sector, for example, they know in medium to long term the digitalization, innovation, and that transformation is going to happen because consumers expect it. Um, so we've we've applied targets across uh, our whole whole industry in Ireland, um, and they're moving uh, quickly actually in transition when it comes to energy, for example. But also, I said it goes back to the other point. I think the problem in Europe at the moment is the debate is too polarized about politicians or the European Commission telling people. Um, you know what they what they what they should do, rather than trying to bring people on that journey with us. And it goes to Eva's point as well when it comes to agriculture. So, for example, in Ireland, uh, we, if you think of the energy system historically, Europe, the European economy has been fueled by energy from the east, has fueled the industry of the west. Um, from an Irish perspective, with the Atlantic edge, we've the and the Atlantic Ocean, we have a sea mass seven times the size of our country, which has the ability to be a massive net energy exporter that that can fuel Europe in a much more sustainable way with cheap green energy. And that's the, op the opportunity, as I said, isn't about containing ep economic opportunity, it's trying to fuel innovation, digitalization opportunities of the future through cleaner, greener energy. Uh, and that's a more positive discussion uh, with citizens and with industry, and it's trying to develop the grid connectivity around that. So for example, we have a new Celtic interconnector with France, which we're developing, which will provide opportunities for export in the medium term. And on the issue of agriculture, um, there is a lot of concern and polarization, particularly in Ireland at the moment, on the new EU uh, restoration law, which is being discussed at Parliament. And we have to make sure that, um, that family farms can can be sustained and particularly rural communities can be sustained through the, through the transition. Um, and if, if that doesn't happen, we're going to shrink the centre ground of politics and to the detriment of the climate agenda overall. Uh, and that's why I think the messaging of the centre ground politics will need to be strengthened uh, moving into 2024. I can tell you all about it, about the last elections in the yes. Netherlands, for example. So thanks for this. And I think it's yeah, uh, wise that we as European Union set sets the goal of the direction in a way, but always keep in mind that there should be some bottom-up approach. Yeah. Romina, would you like to come in on that? Oh, so many good questions. Uh, do I have to choose? 
Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do well, you have only one minute. If you can't yeah. say it in one minute, you can't say it in an hour. So. Uh, okay, let me go uh, start with adaptation. I think it's important to include the defense ministry in that, and that's how we tackle it in Sweden. I have a lot of dialogue with our minister for civil defense because it's a matter of security. And uh, taking adaptation to that level is a very important thing. And then we have strategies that we adopt yearly and we uh, change because it changes all the time, right? Um, when it comes to uh, the question from the uh, lady from Fianna Fáil, uh, regarding small family farms, I think that it's very, uh, you know, you have to be optimistic uh, when it comes to that as well. Of course, you can speak about uh, bigger farmers being efficient and using uh, land in an efficient way, but you c there's also so much innovation when it comes to, for example, um, the yassel, um, we call it in Swedish, uh, oh. the... Um, Manure, manure, yes, uh, like fossil-free uh, produced uh, manure and, <laughs> and things like this. So there is a development of the agricultural sector that would uh, make it possible to be uh, uh, nature positive even when it comes to smaller farms. So it's important to also have that aspect. And as uh, um, the uh, panelist next to me was also saying, it's very important that in the EU we need to set the types of regulation that hit in the right way, like laws. For example, the effort sharing regulation is a very good way of tackling it, saying you have to do this, this much is what you need to accomplish, but then not get into the nitty-gritty details of how we are to accomplish that, because we are different countries with different uh, possibilities and different uh, you know, um, ways of handling uh, climate transition. Thank you so much. I want to go back to the audience as well. Are there any more questions that you would like to raise? Come on, this is the possibility. Hey? Don't leave home and think, ah, oh, I should have questioned this. If yes, please. Thank you. My name is Jessica Johnson. I'm a counselor here uh, outside uh, Stockholm. My question to the panel is um, maybe a hard one, but it was mentioned that the policies that were decided on on 2015 uh, never got followed up on. What are we doing today that guarantees that that is not going to be uh, repeated? Very good question. What the, what so the question is basically like <laughs> that all the, the, especially European legislations, the targets are not always been met. So for example, 2015, how do we make sure that we don't make the same mistakes for coming targets, especially on climate change? And I think also on biodiversity, you know? Um, uh, well, I, yeah, sorry, I don't, yeah, you have, you, but maybe first to the ministers because... Well, yeah. I would say from an Irish perspective, prior to this government coming into office, we had climate goals which weren't set in primary legislation. What we've set now is a 50% reduction is in primary legislation and there's a, there's a legal obligation on government and on our parliament to implement that. And we have to, we've had to publish cl climate action plans every year which have sectoral emissions targets again set down on a legal trajectory. And that has, str much, uh, that has strengthened implementation because there's a legal interface uh, to it um, and I think has made a big difference from a governance um, perspective. If things are soft and don't have a legal basis, there's a good chance they won't happen. Um, but I think doing that has brought people with us as well and um, actually our colleague, the co-president Timmy Dooley who's here, um, led our party's role in the last Climate Action Committee on developing a cross-party consensus on climate which actually helped deliver, like we, in our Climate Act, we had nearly the whole Irish Parliament supported it because we, we built that consensus around taking the action across all sectors which has made us it, it much easier to, to implement the, the change required. Yeah, it's almost the same uh, answer, actually, because uh, we have the um, uh, climate political framework in Sweden that we adopted, and uh, seven out of eight parties stood behind it, so it has a stable majority and, and uh, it consists of a climate law and it consists of climate goals that we are to fulfill and then we also have a climate political council that uh, is um, uh, well uh, um, reviewing the uh, the policy that is put up so they give a report each year and it's uh, it consists of scientists and different scientists from different fields it's not only like ecological it's for example behavioral scientists looking at how our policies are hitting and whether they're hitting in the correct way so uh, there's a lot of things that you can do but just having that uh, uh, gathered uh, um, and um, grounded policy work that a lot of uh, parties are standing behind so you don't get that whiplash between uh, governments is an important part and also being able to get the um, um, uh, require the the responsibility from each other as as a uh, government and, and opposition great <coughs> uh, okay we are already at four o'clock 
Do we have still five minutes or a couple of minutes for the last panelist to? Yes, I see. I hear a yes there. I hear a yes. <laughs> Kira and then Hakima. So I short because uh, we have to. I want to enter on a uh, uh, to end on a positive note. So, Ukrainian Green Deal and implementing Green Deal rules is in my party's program, and we never gave up on it, no matter that the war is going on. And uh, at the EU accession process for Ukraine, we have the Green Deal implementation, and we will be working very hard to make sure that once the war is over and we are becoming members of European Union, we have the, all the investments flowing in and it's being used wisely uh, according to the rules that will be set, so we would not repeat the mistakes that have been done before. However, at that moment, I really hope that you guys have things settled down and uh, have the solutions for <laughs> many of those issues. So we would have a very good example and we will uh, have a very good understanding of what to do, what not to do and how to move forward all together to a better, cleaner world. Thanks so much, because that's mostly uh, um, oh, uh, forgotten that we as the European Union really should set an example and also Absolutely. be the guide in the rest of the world. Thanks. We are looking up to you guys, so please <laughs> set up a good Use example. Use it wisely then. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Hakima. Yeah, the final words, and then we really have to close this okay, event. Okay, so it's short, be short. short and <laughs> okay, punchy. Okay, I, I will conclude by saying, to th by the way, this is the first way of time I heard adaptation in the north. Generally, the southern countries were talking about yes. adaptation. And we used to tell them, the more you mitigate, the less you need to adapt. This is end of argument. I, I want to end by saying that climate change has no nationality, no border, no religion. And it's happening yesterday, today, and will continue to happen. We did the mistake to put on the Paris Agreement the long-term strategy. 2050, but it's not, the, it, climate change has no timeline, no agenda. So we should act now, today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> Final, I would like to thank you, so the panelists very much uh, for, for being here. I think it really shows that the why is not a questionable. We need to do something on climate change. We need to do something on biodiversity. We need to do something, especially also on the war on Ukraine and the dependency of of, of, of all other aspects, but the how is, I think, uh, the, 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 the difficult one here, and it shows that if you're sitting together and really take the time to listen to each other, then you really can achieve uh, things. So, thanks a lot for this. I would like to uh, thank Hakima al um Kira, uh, sorry. Rudik. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Jack uh, Ch uh, Chambers and Romina Puruktari. Pur sorry. Yes, yes please. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank nice you. to meet you. I'm so amazed.